My name is Rose. Um, I'm the Associate Director of Partnerships here, and I'm really happy uh, to partner with this organization, um, Be Social Change, for this event. Um, they are actually a social impact community in New York City, empowering people from all sectors and industries to build purpose-driven careers, businesses, and lives. They provide year-round professional development classes, social entrepreneurship education, networking events, panel discussions, peer mentorship, and a bunch of other stuff that's really cool. Um, and the mission is to build social sector capacity by making professional development affordable and accessible to all. Kind of sounds like a similar thing to what BRIC does. So, so for those of you guys who have, who have just at BRIC for the first time, BRIC is the leading presenter of free or low cost cultural programming in Brooklyn and one of the leading in New York. So thank you guys for joining us here. You may know us by Celebrate Brooklyn. We have Brick TV Studios. We have Brooklyn Free Speech. We have a contemporary art practice right here, the spinning wheel, and a lot of other cool stuff. And Marcos, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, he is kind of inspiration. I was reading your bio, and uh, one of the things that you say is that you led a double life, which is a little bit, I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but uh, he's been a nonprofit innovator of, uh, as a research officer for the American Psychological Association, a tech strategist and leadership researcher of Girl Scouts of the USA. Um, he's done, uh, as well as VP of programs at the White House Project, designing, designing leadership development programs to increase the number of women elected into office. Tell me that isn't cool. Give him a round of applause, please. And he's also uh, the co-founder and executive director of Be Social Change. Um, and Leslie, you're gonna find out a lot more about her tonight, so I won't say too much, but she is our illustrious leader here at BRIC. And uh, it, to give you a little flavor of what BRIC is about really quick, I'm gonna show you guys some things, and then we'll delve right in with Marcos. We wait for someone to say yes to us. That's what we wait for. There is something so incredible about the moment when someone says yes to you and says, yes. They said, yes, Helga, come and make your work. All are welcome here. Downtown Brooklyn, Prospect Park, Coney Island, Crown Heights, Brooklyn Heights, and the list goes on and on and on. But the other piece of it is having the community say, it's not just for me to take in art, it is also about my voice, my point of view, and me learning to express myself. For my community, East New York, Bed-Stuy, it was just all the different things that people in low-income communities struggle with. Unhealthy foods that gave them heart disease, obesity. That was the inspiration for me to share how to cook foods on food stamps. So that's kind of how my show blossomed, how I blossomed as a chef. Don't blame us for this. I'm not blaming us. You are my soulmate. How can I be your soulmate if I am the problem in your life? It's important to have spaces, especially for a queer community, that is safe. And Brick is a safe place for us to be doing our work. This play is the first play I actually set in Brooklyn, and I think it's because I found my home here. I spent my summer here, and also last summer. I've been learning a lot about myself and how I could project my voice and how I could um, know when to act and how to act better. 
and we impress all our parents. Not a lot of places feel like there's entry points and there's ways to get in the door. And when I came in here, there was a gallery, there was music, there was a cafe, there was a vibe, there was like local high school students hanging out on the stoop. I mean, the stoop is such a great thing. Anyone who's grown up in New York, the stoop is a significant symbol. An organization like that, that has got a great space that really empowers people to seek out and to pursue ideas. I guess it's sort of like the People's Museum, in a way, for Brooklyn. The first thing that people think about is, well, what's your price point? Our price point, that's an easy one. The vast majority of what we do is free, and Brick is the leading presenter of free cultural programming in Brooklyn. It's all about public. Thank you, Brick, on behalf of my students for giving them the opportunity to be able to create and have a voice. So I come from a family that is by any means low-income family. So if I were in that situation now, I can walk and break and participate. These doors are open for everyone. Arts for all the people, it's really that simple. I love you people. <laughs>set to go we're set to go well welcome everybody thank you all for coming uh how many of you is your first be social change event great and how many of you is your first time here at brick okay good so got some new people in here um so thank you rose for the great introduction and helping to make this happen wanted to thank jamie uh, who's our program partnerships manager at Be Social Change. This also wouldn't have happened without her, as well as our thanks to our volunteers. Um, so yeah, I, I'm very excited to be here. And Brick and Be Social Change have very similar missions in wanting to provide people with the knowledge, the skills, and empower them to um, grow their purpose, accomplish their goals, and also have an impact in themselves, in their relationships, and in their community. Um, so I was very excited when Rose ended up suggesting that we ended up uh, connecting here and having this fireside. Um, we usually do these on a monthly basis. Uh, we host a lot of events really focused on what we'd call accelerating serendipity. Having people that normally don't get to bump shoulders collide, having ideas and knowledge, being able to be shared and get connected, because that's where a lot of creativity and innovation really comes, seemingly disparate people ideas coming together and forming and making and remaking um, and combining in different ways that hadn't been done before. So wanted to thank you and welcome Leslie for, for jumping into the hot seat. Well, I'm really thrilled to be here and I'm really thrilled that you all are here. Welcome to Brick. Um, so that was a beautiful introduction and usually uh, when we do these fireside chats, the first question is, tell me a little bit about the organization, but they did a really good, great job. So one- Thank you, Binta, who's over there, our director of marketing and communications. Yes, which we are gonna t dive in a little bit later because one of the things that was so interesting about Brick when I first encountered it was, you have branding for a non that every nonprofit should strive for, which is amazing. Um, but we'll dive into that a little bit. So. Part of this is not only getting understanding of the organization, the Fireside Chats, but also the story behind them and also the people that are driving them forward. So I would love to just um, dive into how, a little bit more of your narrative of how did you actually come to Brick? What's your career journey way, way, way back from the beginning and how did you arrive here at Brick? Okay, that's, um, that could take up a little bit of time. <laughs> um, I'm actually trained as a lawyer. I graduated from law school Oh, goodness, uh, a lot of years ago, um, 33 years ago. And it's interesting, in between my second and third year, I had a very intense, of law school, I had a very intense conversation with my mother. Um, I was working at a, a you know, big law firm at the time. I was getting paid what seemed like an inordinate amount of money. And I think it was like $800 a week, which was just crazy. And you know, for a 23-year-old, and you know, 100 years ago, um, and I just, you know, I said I felt like there were parallels between what I was doing and prostitution, and my mother was so upset with me. How could you think earning a living, you know, is you know, is selling yourself? And I, you know. I really held on to that thought, and I think the underlying point was I wasn't doing something that I really cared about. 
and and I think that was my very inarticulate 23 year old way of of saying that you know it just it didn't feel meaningful to me um, and I, tr I had lots of attempts to kind of break free from the path one of them was um, deciding to take my third year of law school off and um, going to work for a nonprofit in DC was the plan. My parents, who are immigrants, my mother's a Holocaust survivor, both my parents were born in Germany. They had a really hard time when they came to this country. They were, my, you know, mother was cleaning houses and, you know, it was a, it was a, if it was a rough start. So the idea of me stopping my education before I completed it led to enormous family tension. And uh, my dad stopped talking to me when I was gonna leave for the year, and then it turns out the job that I had secured, I promise you I won't go through every month no, in great detail, <laughs> but keep going. Um, the job that I secured was um, in a department at a public interest organization trying to enhance democratic ideals, and they closed the department. And I used that moment when they said, but maybe we can find you another place. I said, oh, never mind, I'm gonna go back to law school, because I was really, really torn. So I graduated law school and um, I ended up on a, in a, um, in a, another big law firm. And I tried to do pro bono work, tried to mix things up, but mostly I was dealing with financial derivatives and litigation that I didn't care about. And I kept, you know, feeling the call and I had a long conversation with the Ford Foundation and that went on forever and ever. And I eventually pulled out of it, but I went to a little law firm that was representing inner city hospitals, trying to get access to the capital market. And finally, I made my first step to doing something really meaningfully. I was trying to bring updated, you know, I was part of a team trying to bring updated medical facilities to the South Bronx and to Jamaica, Queens. But eventually that became, um, you know, not as engaging as it should be. And my first daughter was born, I decided I would step back I was lucky enough to get a gig teaching for a few years, but then I panicked again after a few years. Um, if there was a, there was a depression in the economy in New York in the early 90s, and um, I went back to my law firm and worked for about um, seven or eight years, became a partner in the law firm, and then two things happened. One, I got very sick and thankfully recovered, but was really facing issues that I'd never faced before. And two, my nice little cool boutique law firm that was socially conscious merged into a big LA firm and I found myself as a partner at a big LA firm and it was a big existential crisis all over again. So I started looking and um, the way I started looking was to try to figure out what of my experience really added up to anything that would be useful on the non-practicing law side. Mm -hmm. And I had breakfast with a, somebody who had a children the same age as my oldest daughter, and she said, oh, you'd be perfect for brick. And like so many people, and it was great to hear you say that about our branding and how important that was, I did what so many people did, and I said, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> What's a brick? This was 2004, and um, she explained to me a little bit about what Brick did. It was very, it seemed very kind of diffuse to me. But three days after that conversation, the executive director from Brick, the then executive director just quit, left. And all of a sudden they had a need for somebody who had some skill, a skill set similar to mine. Brick was in the midst of trying to develop this former, um, vaudeville house and movie palace into an art center. This was 2004, the building didn't look like this. And, um, and I stepped in as somebody who had worked on trying to get new hospital facilities in the South Bronx and new trains and on the Amtrak lines, as somebody who could advance a capital project. And that's how I first got involved here. Sorry for that long-winded answer. No, it was a great time. answer. Sure. And, and part of, I actually appreciate you that, that longer answer because I've definitely 
uh, had people up here and it's too short. Um, and But the reason why I think that's such a, an important part, especially to start this conversation, is so many people that come to be social change are looking for that meaning and are looking for that purpose. And I think it's really important to recognize that it's a longer journey and it often takes lots of twists and turns. And then you don't know when an opportunity arises and you get to, uh, you have to seize it. So when that, uh, when that actually opened up, what was your process of, was it a very easy decision, this is what I'm gonna do, or did it take a while for you to actually make that transition? Well, I was originally brought in as a consultant to Brick, mm. and I was working through my law firm, and I had a lot to negotiate. I had two children, I had financial obligations, I had a partnership with my spouse, you know, who was counting on me to contribute certain amounts to the relationship and the well-being of the family and it was so we were sort of classic Brooklyn commuters you know we lived in one neighborhood and we commuted to Midtown every day so it was I, I was lucky in that I had a little bit of a of a runway before we got to the point you know I, I was trying to advance the capital project Brick did not have anybody sitting in the ED chair, the executive director chair at the time. And it came to a point about six months later, five, six months later, that Brick realized it really needed somebody to serve as its executive director. And I had fallen in love with the organization and we'd gotten our minds wrapped around working in this community, living in this community, and earning less. And then, so obviously, there's been a transformation over the past close to decade or so. Um, so when you came in, where was Brick at, and how did you make that transition to this amazing space and all the work you do now? Well, there are a lot of people here right now, and a lot of people who work here who might not be here right now who were very involved in that. And there was an extraordinary board of directors. But this, I've been thinking. Um, is there anybody in the audience right now who is part of our team in 2005? We've got a number of BRIC staffers who are still here. I think we were about 36 employees. Mm -hmm. About, you know, 24 of them worked in the media program. All of our other programs were really separated, really siloed, and really tiny. The, um, how many of you know our BRIC Celebrate Brooklyn Festival? So, fantastic premier um, New York City performing arts festival. It's like Brigadoon. It pops up every summer and becomes this beautiful um, experience for 200,000 people every year. Full-time staff in 2005, one. It was one and a half people in that program. And again, it was like Brigadoon people popped up. The gallery, you're looking at our part of our extraordinary contemporary art exhibition space here. We were in a jewel box of a space in Brooklyn Heights, um, not including the education director. We've got our current education director who's brick wide now. That per full-time staff was two, two and a half people. I don't know, can you call a full-time staff half a person? Um, and up on the second floor here, there was a media program that was primarily focused on community voices, on what is now known as our free speech initiatives, but it was you know, sort of um, hidden away up on the second floor of this building when you, if you walked into it, there was a tiny little lobby. I wandered in once looking for motor vehicles and, um, and then I ended up on the top floor, our neighbors, Urban Glass, are there. So um, we were tiny, we were siloed, we were 36 people. Yeah, and then when you came in and officially took that role of the ED and recognizing this is where things are at, how did you come up or what, what was the vision of where Brick was gonna go? How did that form? Well, I think the, the board had the vision that, um, and it was really embodied in the idea of this building where all of BRICS programs would come together under a single roof. And there's that physical embodiment and then there is the, the, the virtual state of that. And it was really the building that inspired us to 
come together. And for me, what I understood about Brick from the first day that I started exploring its programs was that there were through lines in every one of the programs. We, as, as Rose said earlier, as that video said so beautifully, we present cultural programming for free, okay? That goes across the board regardless of discipline. The other thing that we did was incubate the work and enable and try to empower artists and media makers to further their practice. And that was across the board. And the third thing was the education program, the youth education program. So there were, you know, I, I saw those three through lines um, and I think they really inspired the board's goal to try to restore this wasted building to an all interdisciplinary space. Yeah, and how long did that take uh, to start pulling all that together and then eventually come and get this building and grow it to where it is now? Uh, every minute of every day. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we're very much still in progress. I think that, you know, the original, um, the original plan, to, you gotta understand this building was 63,000 square feet of just columns and floors, three floors of, you know, raw, of raw space, which pockets of which had been activated. And the goal to reopen it so that it had visibility to the street and that it was interdisciplinary was first articulated in 1996. And it was such a slog, it was amazing. When I got here in 2004 or five, um, we had a particular vision for it and that's what I was hired to do was to really get this building project done. We opened in 2013. It was really slow. Wow, yeah. yeah. So then, can you tell us a little more about in those three elements, uh, especially there's the, there's the programming for free, aside from the festival, what are some of the other types of programs that you end up providing? Because I can tell there's a, a number of new people here. Well, I, I, I don't think our spring brochure is out yet, but certainly look on our website. So the, you know, the, the, the stoop that you are on, which as I think Baba, who, who's helped develop, who developed this exhibition was talking about, this, the stoop is New York. It's the ultimate come and hang out, feel comfortable, et cetera. There's a ton of free programming that happens on this stoop. There is the stoop series, which is almost every Tuesday night. There's brick flicks. There is, help me out guys. What? Start B-side, which is where we feature emerging um, bands in the television studio. And then, of course, there's this contemporary art gallery. All those things are free. Come in anytime, sit down, please buy a cup of coffee from Hungry Ghost, which you know, we, we need your support in that way. But so those are, those are all free programs. Um, other free programs outside of this building, we are in public libraries throughout the borough. Um, we have house parties four or five times a year, which are all day family focused programs, we have town hall meetings, we are town hall conversations where we try to create an opportunity. One of the things we feel about access at Brick is that it's not just about price point. I, well, I said that in the video, right? I'll say it again. It's not just about price point, it's not just about atmosphere, but it's about community voices. So town halls are a big part of that mix as well. Yeah. And what kind of town halls? Well, they're generally on um, socially pressing issues. Our very first one was on race policing and civil rights, as was our second one. Um, when we were having a, a theater performance in the ballroom, and if you guys haven't seen the space, by the way, there's this magnificent gallery, lots of other platforms for visual arts, but there's a, a state-of-the-art um, uh, theater performance space behind the Hungry Ghost Cafe, and there's another artist workspace further down the hall, and then upstairs we have uh, extensive media facilities for the public, as well as those TV studios. So, what was the question you asked, oh, Marcus? Just, <laughs> what were some of the type of the town halls? But that was, that oh, was great. yes, yeah. so we were having a, a theater performance by Roger Guinevere Smith based on the Rodney King story, 
and he was opening the night that the non-indictment verdict came, or grand jury decision came down in the Eric Garner killing. And it was an incredible convergence of what we do in performing arts and what we do in terms of community voices. And Roger asked whether we could have another town hall meeting, which we had here. The, the third town hall meeting was, Binta, can you help me out? Gentrification, that was the most extraordinary experience. I was sitting there, my, my mouth was so wide open because I was learning so much from the questions and the conversation. We've also talked about youth voices, we have talked about climate change and how it affects our local community, and our upcoming one is on criminal justice reform. And then uh, I want to ask a little bit about the artistic piece and empowering artists, but what also in terms of the programming, I know that once you end up taking one of the brick brochures, you're going to see they offer tons of stuff. It's, it's uh, tons of educational Sprawling content. Sprawling is a word you yeah. sometimes use. Um, and, and as a result, what's the type of uh, workshops that you end up doing? Many of them free, some of them low cost and paid, um, but what are some of, the type, some of the type of workshops? On the media side? Yeah. So our media education program is really amazing and it ranges from giving people the technical tools to um, create video either in a studio or out in the field. And by the way, we'll f we are able to follow that up with giving our community access to cameras and editing equipment and audio equipment, et cetera, to um, there's Pops, he can speak about this as well as, as, well as I can, um, to um, documentary filmmaking. I think that the media education team is really working to go beyond traditional public access education and really help people with their storytelling abilities. So it's a wide range of classes centered here at Brick House, but we also offer classes at the Grand Army Plaza Library, Coney Island Library, we have a studio um, that people can create their television in, in um, uh, New Lots in East New York. We have equipment checkout and classes, Kings Highway, and we're about to open another branch in Bushwick. Oh, wow. Um, and then kind of rounding up the three pieces, what are some, for, we got to see some of, the, some of the artists and some of the people that, uh, that you end up working with, and what are kind of some of the core ways that you're empowering artists in Brooklyn? Um, in terms of the part of our work that you know goes under the shorthand incubation, in addition to the media program offerings, which is you know very a key part of it, we have in the performing arts department we have an extraordinary lab program where artists are given s space technical resources, a little bit of financial support to be able to develop a work. Oftentimes it's emerging artists, sometimes it's established artists that are working on um, a new piece or going in a new direction. So that's sort of a you know key element of the performing arts incubation process. We also do a major interdisciplinary residency, which is what you're seeing right now, and if after the program, please do take a look at this exhibition. We've been joined this year by an extraordinary, this month, by an extraordinary group of artists who are, the thrust of our fireworks program is to say, well, if we gave you the keys to this place and some support, what would you do? And um, Baba Israel and Yako 440 and the, their arts, art, artist families have created an amazing theater piece and have been having free program after pre program the stoop, on the stoop and have put in this exhibition. So that commissioning program is really significant. And then on the contemporary art side, we have an artist registry, which has over almost 1,600 Brooklyn artists whose work can be um, accessed by neighborhood, by genre, by medium. Um, and we also have an exhibition program that really focuses on exhibiting the work of Brooklyn artists and other commissioning programs. But next, February 9th, we're having an opening party for our open call exhibition. It's our second annual one. We did an open call to the artists in our registry saying, let us know what you would put in a show that has a particular theme. 
More than 250 artists responded. I wish that every one of them could have been in it, but we're proud that we'll be showing, exhibiting the work of 130 artists. So exhibition opportunities that otherwise wouldn't be there for Brooklyn artists. Wow. Um, and I think what's so interesting about your location is you are really at the center of a very emerging part of Brooklyn. Not only by Atlantic Center, but there's a lot of transition downtown Brooklyn and, and, and just around this Fort Greene area. Um, so how are you reaching out to the Brooklyn community? How are you bringing all these people in, both in terms of people coming to um, experience everything in Brick, but also artists? Well, I'm, you know, I'm st I still have a lawyer way down in me, so I'm going to correct one thing yes, you said, because yes, yes, you, yes. you described this as an emerging neighborhood, mm -hmm. and we don't think of it as an emerging neighborhood. We think of it as a dr drastically changing neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We cannot believe the rate of change. When I came here, everything was low level. And the building on the corner here, they ra started raising brownstones, and all of a sudden there was a 40-some-odd story building, maybe it's 30-some-odd stories, and it just looked like a sore thumb. And now it looks like the norm. So one of the things that we feel very strongly about is that um, we have the opportunity, by having this great space and by having the focus that we do, of serving as a as a bulwark against displacement. Um, and we're trying to be really mindful about how we go about that. We're actually in the middle of a community engagement plan mm -hmm. to figure out how we can best continue to connect with the communities that have been here for a really long time, um, who are being displaced, but are not being, you know, um, they're still here, you know, and they still need a place to go. Yeah. And they still need to feel like the arts organizations in the neighborhood are, are serving them. So, um, so I, I think there's a lot more to come on that front, but I think that um, we're, we're focusing on partnerships. Rose does an amazing job with our local partnerships, and we're really trying to expand that work. We had, we had a a Brooklyn-based choreographer who didn't have the opportunity to have a Brooklyn season, even though he's a world-renowned choreographer, Ronald K. Brown, Evidence, a dance company. And we in connected with a lot of dance schools in the area and asked them to come and bring their students. And that's the type of work that we're doing to try to connect with the community. Plus, I should say that Brick TV, if you haven't watched it yet, and if you're a Cablevision person, it's channel 70. If you're a Time Warner cable person, it's channel 756. It's somewhere in the 40s on Verizon. And we're on the web at, um, at we have a YouTube channel. We are posting 100, approximately 100 videos a month that are all about Brooklyn. And the town hall program is actually part of the Brick TV initiative. And I think keeping an eye focused on the people that uh, make Brooklyn what it is, have always made Brooklyn what it is, is you know a, a key part, one of our secret weapons. Yeah. And we'll be sending all that information definitely in a follow-up email. And second, I do actually appreciate that you ended up correcting and clarifying that word. Uh, which is emerging, and you're absolutely right, it's not. And I was really thinking much more rapidly changing, like you mentioned, as well as not emerging in the sense that this area has a very rich history from an artistic standpoint. And you're really, Cree Brick has this really unique opportunity to create a space, not only to bring it all together, but as you ended up mentioning, um, in this rapid change and rapid rapid growth, it provides a central place where people can come together and actually discuss all that's happening. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to a little bit of a leadership question in terms of as you came into the organization, what's been one of the biggest challenges that you faced as a leader growing Brick to, uh, and your team to where it is today? And what, how did you overcome that challenge? Well, one of the, there were two like main things. One, I'd never managed anything in my entire life, so that was a bit of a challenge. And the other was I was at best an arts consumer. I was coming in to be the CEO of this organization that was, you know, active in a 
um, in an area of the world that I knew very little about. And those were really hard challenges. Yeah. And then in terms of growing your team, how are you bringing the people in that, and it's because it seems like you're going, growing pretty rapidly. We are, we're now 85 full-time employees and lots of, Betsy, you probably know the answer to this, the part-time, <laughs> it's like a, a billion. <laughs> Betsy is our executive vice president and has been my um, my you know key partner since two thousand mid two thousand seven. Betsy Smullyan. Um, so so it has been really rapid. I think and w and we were separated for a long time. So when I first got here, some of us were upstairs on one side of the hall, some of us were upstairs on the other side of the hall. There were steel doors between us. You couldn't see between them. The gallery team was somewhere else. And then during construction, we split up even further. Some of us went to the old American Can building. Some of us went to Dumbo. The gallery team was still far away. So it was really, it was really hard and um, I think we, struggled, and it was a lot of um, conversation, a lot of listening. Yeah. Um, we were also, uh, there was actually a lot of tension at Brick amongst the staff. I think there was a lot of distrust, and there was, um, there wasn't good communication. So, the, you know, I think, it's, for those of you who are thinking about careers in management, or have careers in management, for those of you who are thinking about going to mission-based work, I think the, mo the, the key thing you can do is really have your ears wide open to, and really talk to as many people as you possibly can, listen and try to stitch things together in a way that, that makes some sense. Um, I, you know, we try to do, at this point, since we've been in this building, Betsy and I were just talking about this, we try to have weekly staff meetings. We try to talk across departments so that people know what's happening in the building. It's so easy. We're all so busy in our lives that it is incredibly easy to just have tunnel, tunnel vision. This is what I do. It's gonna take me all day to do it. And, you know, but then you, when you start hearing about what other people are doing, you, and, and I think, Marcos, you said this before, it's about making connections across groups. So these regular staff gatherings, lunches, occasional happy hours, being in the same space is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And we just gave an internal training for a nonprofit yesterday with a real focus, uh, a lot of it management, real focus on essentially organizations are vehicles for human collaboration. And that collaboration needs to be managed um, but it's at the heart, it's just all about relationships. And oftentimes, as you mentioned, we tend to focus on the work, the work, the work, and the what, and what, and what, and not necessarily the who. And we're starting to see, and a lot of organizations are starting to see that, when you focus on the who, uh, there's better outcomes that come about from it. Um, but it's hard to always think about that when there's so much, to, so much of the what to do. Um, so where are you looking as you, and I didn't realize that this just opened up in 2013 um, until recently. So where are you seeing Brick five years from now and where do you see yourselves growing um, both in terms of programming and offerings and then just within the community? Well, I think, um, you know, again, um, the, the Brick board has been a good um, guidepost for us and we're, we're very fortunate not all organizations have yeah. great boards but they've been very clear with us that because we're so sprawling being really clear about our artistic identity is something we need to grapple with and so we started a process last spring of really thinking about our programming really taking that part that I said, you know, we're the leading presenter of free cultural programming in Brooklyn. Our audiences are intended to broadly reflect the demographics of New York City. So, you know, unpack that. What does that really mean? So in a few weeks, we're gonna present a programming plan. I think what you'll see here is a lot more cohesion in how we 
are able to describe what it is that we're doing. You know, for those of you who have been to the Brick Celebrate Brooklyn Festival, you know that it's really known for music programming. Creating our identity as a music presenter at Brick House will help a lot. The head of that program, and I don't know if Jack is here. Hi, hi you guys. Um, but, we, you know, Jack and Diane, who are in our performing arts team, and, and an, another gentleman developed a concept for a Brick Jazz Fest, which we had, you know, concentrated five great days of intensive jazz here. Mm. So what I think you'll see more and more of is the ability to, to say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Of course that's going to be at Brick House because you'll know who we are. And then the other piece is the community engagement mm -hmm. piece. Um, and the other thing we have to struggle with as a nonprofit, the free is a really lousy business model. <laughs> I'm going to pass the hat at the end of this conversation. <laughs> so we have to figure out, you know, we, we've been financially stable for a really long time. We, we ran in the black every year until 2000. We actually still are running in the black. But there are certain areas of our operations that are losing money, and that, that, that are in deficit. I shouldn't say they're losing money. We're not really trying to make money. But we have to figure out how to be really smart about um, enhancing our revenues consistent with our mission. And that's, we're still working on that. Wheels are still turning, right, guys? Yeah, that's always that hard thing, especially as there's so many programs and opportunities you provide. It reminds me of, uh, a previous fireside chat that we did was Nancy Lublin, who founded Dress for Success and uh, CEO of DoSomething.org and now Crisis Text Line. And they went through this very interesting period where they decided to cut 50% of their programming. Um, oh, no. And some of the most um, wow. financially successful programming because they had to go through this identity journey of where can we create the greatest impact. Mm -hmm. And it always is that hard challenge of where can I create the greatest impact um, that brings in the most revenue, but also you don't want to not serve certain groups of people as part of that process. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting thing because mm -hmm. I think that, um, what's the word? Inertia? I don't think that's exactly the right word, but inertia can really set in. We've been doing this for 15 years, so this is what we do. And the process of stepping back and saying, well, what are we trying to accomplish? Yeah. Where is the highest impact? is um, a really important part of any nonprofit manager's work. Um, and it sounds like Dress for Success really took a hard look at itself. Or Do Something, Do Something did. Yeah, oh, Do Something, do something did. did and ended up cutting half just to, uh, they said it was like scale through shrinking. Um, so one of the other questions I had as you brought this up is that how did this beautiful brand come about? I'm assuming this brand wasn't part of the, part of the brick uh, marketing and branding when you first came in, because I do have to say that was one of the first things that uh, appealed to me as soon as I uh, learned about it. Thank you, marketing team. <laughs> Laurel's up there. Everybody's been part of it. It's been excruciating, actually. Yeah. It has been one of the hardest things I think we've done. And Laurel's nodding. A lot of people up there are nodding. So when when we got here, these, the, the organization was called Brooklyn Information and Culture. Um, and each of the programs had their own completely unrelated identity. There was BCAT. Everybody remember the cat? Pop, yep. Um, there was Celebrate Brooklyn Festival, which had no mention of brick anywhere in its identity. Occasionally, tip. we've got all the posters upstairs. We're like, okay, somebody said put brick on the poster that year. And Rotunda Gallery, you know, entirely separate. And then we decided to create this very rudimentary black box space up in our offices. And we gave it its own logo, but it was at least called Brick Studio. Um, and, I, you know, we just renamed the all the... Brick TV, Brick TV. It was Brooklyn Independent Media until August. And that followed us realizing that we weren't getting the kind of press and, um, and listings information that connected Brick to our flagship program, the thing that started it all. So the 
everybody came together and said, you know what, it's the Brick Celebrate Brooklyn Festival. But the process from 2004 to now has been the most excruciating part of my job. Um, so what's coming up in 2016? What are new things coming up in 2016 with Brick? Uh, well, we're, our spring season starts in February, right? Um, we've got a, this Saturday, if it doesn't snow too hard, we're going to have one of our great house parties. Um, we will continue to upload really interesting video content, and student, including scripted series as well as the work of our communities on our digital platforms as well as on cable television. The Brick Celebrate Brooklyn Festival will open on June 8th. Mark your calendars. If you haven't been there yet, definitely come. Um, our first exhibition, Open Call, opens here on February 9th. And our Whisper or Shout exhibition, which is about artists in the social sphere and artists in social practice, opens March 16th. Um, Jackie, the education show, opens 18th of May. There will be lots of small solo shows of Brooklyn artists. Um, and what am I missing? Did I miss it? The Be Free Awards are on April 2nd, 3rd, 2nd, um, which is really for our producer community where we're recognizing um, their work. We've got a town hall on criminal justice on March 24th. Binta, what did I forget? Concerts, Laurel. Another Brick Jazz Fest, Another Brick Jazz Fest in October. But we do have four great Music concerts coming up in the ballroom space just in the next couple of months. Um, so I urge you to go on our website, brickartsmedia.org, and we will have nice old-fashioned print brochures sometime soon. Um, and one question, because the town hall is the something that I actually didn't know that you all are doing, and I think that you're primed to be a central place and community gathering place to do that. Um, who are the people that are coming to those uh, town halls and are people within the community and I'm thinking even political folks within the community coming to those coming to those well the town halls open with a panel discussion mm -hmm. which often will have uh, thought leaders in the in the field as well as we occasionally allow an elected official to, mm -hmm. to speak <laughs> on the panel and then it really it really depends on the issue I uh, you know for the the gentrification town hall, which was January of last year, um, it was really extraordinary. And I would say there was a huge turnout from this local area, which is so significantly affected yeah. by rising real estate prices, you know, et cetera. Um, with the youth, uh, youth Voices town hall, we had, you know, lots of partnerships with high schools and there were a lot of young people there. It really depends on the topic. Yeah, yeah. Climate change, we had a lot of climate change activists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Just a little bit more personal question. Who are some of the people within your career that you feel have inspired, have influenced you in terms of where you've taken the direction of Brick? Or your career I, in general? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I, I, I have to start, and I know this sounds really, I don't know, sycophantic is the right word, but it's actually really true. When I got to Brick, I had never worked with people who were really passionate about what they did. The people in my law firm were really smart. They were incredible negotiators. They were, you know, I learned a tremendous amount from them. But it was seeing the head of the community media program who you know lived and breathed the you know the the first amendment and enabling community voices it was the head of the brick celebrate brooklyn festival who has been on the brick team since 1984 when he was like a child um who couldn't you know who who was exuding energy about the artistic work that 
they were presenting and the sense of community that was being created. That's one thing I always say, I didn't get to say this tonight, this is off topic, no, sorry, no. but if you really want to understand Brick, you got to understand we're a cultural program that was born in a public park. And that really kind of sums up who we are. And it was the, you know, it was our contemporary art program. It was the educators who were making, you know, m making connections. There, were, there was um, one moment where I observed a class in, I think it was in Bushwick, and um, it was a math class, and we were teaching portraiture. And the kids were, most of the kids were learning about ratios from understanding, you know, how it is that you draw a face. These were 11 year olds, but some kids were learning how to measure because they had missed that in first or second grade when you really learn that. So it was my, it was truly my colleagues. It was also, and, the, and you know, it was also the giving nature of our board, which is really incredible, community volunteers, people who are really active in their bu busy lives. Um, all these people taught me to open myself up to being really passionate about what I do and, and to not, to embrace the community. And you've mentioned how strong of a board that you have. Uh, how big is, do you mind if you say how big the board is and how's, how's their engagement influenced Brick? I know there's a number of nonprofit folks in here um, because it sounds like they've been a huge influence and a huge benefit to the organization. They have been and they've had to do their own work to really come together and have done so under the um, auspices of some really great chairs. The Brick board is 26 people at the moment. We can go up to, 30 and their engagement really ranges. I mean, there was one board member who I used to have breakfast with every Friday. I told you one of my big challenges was I'd never managed anything except for my family. And, you know, talking through the process of the things that I would encounter day in and day out and how is it that I talk to people and how do I, what do I do when somebody's really angry and how do I process that? So that was, you know, somebody who kind of, I, I just thought I didn't bring anything to the table. I brought a lot to the table, mm -hmm. but I had a lot to learn. And I had other board, another board member that comes to mind was, is like the most gracious human being I've ever encountered and taught me to um, respond less viscerally and more generously than I'd ever learned in my life. Yeah. Just a couple of examples. Yeah. Um, and we're gonna open up for questions in a bit, and I just wanted to have one last question, which you kind of alluded to, is what would be the one tip or advice that you would give to folks uh, when it came to leadership and leading and managing uh, people? Well, I'm still learning that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that leadership, and this is, I am still learning it. I think that my senior staff colleagues would say that I am maybe 50% of the way there. But I, I think that I came into this thinking that being a leader meant being in charge of things and meetings. And I think a lot more of it is listening and keeping, trying to keep things on track and keeping your eyes on the prize or helping everybody keep their eyes on the prize in terms of goals instead of necessarily being a you know, a, a, a big, you know, bossy person. Yeah. Good. Great. Well, uh, let's give a round of applause for Leslie. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for sharing your story, your narrative, and just a much more. I mean, I learned a lot about Brick tonight, so thank you. Thank you.